This is Thomas Ligotti's The Red Tower, as brought to you with industrial and horror synthesized landscapes by myself, Music Macabre, my good friend, Vitriol Gage. The ruined factory stood three stories high in an otherwise featureless landscape. Although somewhat imposing on its own terms, it occupied only the most unobtrusive place within the gray emptiness of its surroundings, its presence serving as a mere accent upon a desolate horizon. No road led to the factory, nor were there any traces of one that might have led to it at some time in the distant past. If there ever had been such a road, it would have been rendered useless as soon as it arrived at one of the four red brick sides of the factory. Even in the days when the facility was in full operation. The reason for this was simple. No doors had been built into the factory. No loading docks or entryways allowed the penetration of the outer walls of the structure, which was solid brick on all four sides without even a single window below the level of the second floor. The phenomenon of a large factory so closed off from the outside world was a point of extreme fascination to me. It was almost with regret that I ultimately learned about the factory's subterranean access. But of course, that revelation in its turn also became a source of my truly degenerate sense of amazement, my decayed fascination. The factory had long been in ruins, its innumerable bricks worn and crumbling, its many windows shattered, each of its three enormous stories that stood above the ground level was vacant of all but dust and silence. The machinery, which had densely occupied the three floors of the factory, was, as well, considerable space beneath it is said to have evaporated, I repeat, evaporated, soon after the factory ceased its operation, leaving behind only a few spectral outlines of deep vats and tanks and twisting tubes and funnels, harshly grinding gears and levers, giant belts and wheels that could most clearly be seen at twilight and later, not at all. According to these strictly hallucinatory accounts, the whole of the Red Tower, as the factory had been known, had always been subject to fadings at certain times. This phenomenon, in the delirious or dying words of several witnesses, was due to a profound hostility between the noisy and malodorous operations of the factory and the desolate purity of the landscape surrounding it the conflict occasionally resulting in temporary erasures or fadings of the former by the latter. Despite their ostensibly mad or credulous origins, these testimonies, it seemed to me, deserved more than a cursory hearing. The legendary conflict between the gray and territory surrounding it may very well have been a fabrication of individuals who were lost in the advanced stages of either physical or psychic deterioration. Nonetheless, it was my theory, and remains so, that the Red Tower was not always that peculiar or odor, color for which it ultimately earned its fame. Thus, the encrimsoning of the factory was a betrayal, a breaking off, for it is my position that this ancient structure was in long forgotten the days, the same pale hue as the world which encompassed it. Furthermore, with an insight born of dispassion to the point of total despair, I envisioned that the Red Tower was never solely devoted to the lowly functions of an ordinary factory. Beneath the three soaring stories of the Red Tower were two, possibly three other levels. The one immediately below the first floor of the factory was the nexus of a unique distribution system of goods which were manufactured on all three of the floors above. The first subterranean level in many ways resembled and functioned 
in the manner of an old-fashioned underground mine. Elevator compartments enclosed by a heavy wire mesh, twisted and corroded, descended far below the surface into an expansive chamber which had been crudely dug out of the rocky earth and was haphazardly perpetuated by a dense structure of supports. A crisscrossing network of posts and pillars, beams and rafters that included a variety of materials, wood, metal, concrete, bone, and a fine sinewy webbing that was fibrous and quite firm. From this central chamber radiated a system of tunnels that honeycombed the land beneath the gray and desolate surroundings of the Red Tower. Through these tunnels, the goods manufactured by the factory could be carried, sometimes literally, sometimes by hand, but more often by means of small wagons and carts, reaching near and far into the most obscure and unlikely delivery points. The trade that was originally produced by the Red Tower was in some sense remarkable, but not at first of an extraordinarily or especially ambitious nature. This was a gruesome array of goods that could perhaps best be described as novelty items. In the beginning, there was a chaotic quality to the objects and constructions produced by the machinery at the Red Tower, a randomness that yielded formless things of no consistent shape or size or apparent design. Occasionally, there might be a peculiar ashen lump that betrayed some semblance of a face or clawing fingers or perhaps an assemblage that looked like a casket with tiny, irregular wheels. But for the most part, the early production seemed relatively innocuous. After a time, however, things began to fall into place, as they always do, rejecting a harmless and uninteresting disorder never an enduring state of affairs, and taking on the more usual plans and purposes of a viciously intent creation. So, it was that the Red Tower put into its production new, more terrible, perplexing lines of unique novelty items. Among the objects and constructions now manufactured were several of an almost innocent nature. These included tiny, delicate cameos that were heavier than their size would suggest, far heavier, and lockets whose shiny outer surface flipped open to reveal a black reverberant abyss inside, a deep blackness roaring with echoes, along the same lines with a series of lifelike replicas of internal organs and physiological structures many of them evidencing an advanced stage of disease, and all of them displeasingly warm and soft to the touch. There was a fake disembodied hand on which fingernails would grow several inches overnight and insistently grow back should one attempt to clip them. Numerous natural objects, mostly bulbous gourds, were designed to produce a long, deafening scream whenever they were picked up or otherwise disturbed in their vegetable stillness. Less scrutable were such things as hardened globs of lava into whose rough, igneous forms were set a pair of 
roomy eyes that perpetually shifted their gaze from side to side like a restless pendulum. And there was also a humble piece of cement, a fragment broken away from any street or sidewalk that left an almost intractable stain, greasy and green on whatever surface it was placed. But such fairly simple items were eventually followed and ultimately replaced by more articulated goods and constructions. One example of this complex type of novelty item was an ornate music box that, when opened, emitted a brief gurgling or suckling sound in emulation of a dying individual's death rattle. Another product manufactured in great quantity at the Red Tower was a pocket watch in a gold casing, which opened to reveal a curious timepiece whose numerals were represented by tiny quivering insects, while the circling hands were reptilian tongues, slender and pink. But these examples hardly begin to hint at the range of goods that came from the factory during its novelty phase of production. I should at least mention the exotic carpets woven with intricate abstract patterns that when focused upon for a certain length of time, compose themselves into fleeting phantasmagoric scenes of a kind which might pass through a fever-stricken or permanently damaged brain. As it was revealed to me, and as I have already revealed to you, the means of distributing the novelty goods fabricated at the Red Tower was a system of tunnels located on the first level, not the second or possibly the third, that had been excavated below the three-story building itself. It seems that these subterranean levels were not necessarily the foundation of the original plan of the factory, but in fact were a perverse and unlikely development that might have occurred only as the structure known as the Red Tower underwent over time its own mutation from some prior state until it finally became a lowly site for manufacturing. This mutation demanded the excavation, whether from above or below, I cannot say, of a system of tunnels as a means for distributing the novelty goods, which for a time the factory produced. As the unique inventions of the Red Tower achieved their final forms, they seemed to be assigned specific locations to which they were destined to be delivered, either by hand or by small wagons or carts or over sometimes great distances through the system of underground tunnels. Where they might ultimately pop up was anybody's guess. It might be in the back of a dark closet, buried under a pile of undistinguished junk, where some item of the highest and most extreme novelty would lie for quite some time before it was encountered by sheer accident or misfortune. Conversely, the, the same invention or an entirely different one might be placed on the night table beside someone's bed for near immediate discovery. Any delivery point was possible, but none was out of the reach of the Red Tower. There has even been testimony, either intensely hysterical or semi-conscious, of items from the factory being uncovered within the shelter of a living body or one not long deceased. I know that such an achievement was within the factory's powers, given its later production history. But my own degenerate imagination is most fully captured by the thought of how many of those monstrous novelty goods produced at the Red Tower had been scrupulously delivered solely by way of those endless underground tunnels to daringly remote places where they would never be found nor ever could be. Truly, the Red Tower worked in mysterious ways. Just as a system of distribution tunnels had been created by the factory when it was developed into a manufacturer of novelty goods, an expansion of this system was required 
as an entirely new phase of production gradually evolved. Inside the wire mesh compartment that provided access between the upper region of the factory and the underground levels, there was now a special lever installed, which, when pulled back or possibly pushed forward, I don't know such details, enabled one to descend to a second subterranean level. This laterally excavated area was much smaller, far more intimate than the one directly above it. As could be observed, the instant the elevator compartment came to a stop and full view of things was attained. The scene, which now confronted uncertain minds of witnesses, was in many ways like that of a secluded graveyard. Surrounded by a rather crooked fence of widely spaced pickets held together by a rusty wire. The headstones inside the fence all looked closely pressed against one another and were quite common, though somewhat antiquated, in their design. However, there were no names or dates inscribed on these monuments, nothing at all, in fact, with the exception of some rudimentary and abstract ornamentation. This could be verified. This could be verified only when the subterranean graveyard was closely approached, for the lighting at this level was dim and unorthodox, provided exclusively by the glowing stone walls enclosing the area. These walls seemed to have been covered with the phosphorescent paint which bathed the graveyard in a grayish, cloudy haze. For the longest time, I cannot say how long, my morbid reveries were focused on this murky vision of a graveyard beneath the factory, a subterranean graveyard surrounded by a crooked piece of fence and suffused by the highly defective illumination given off by phosphorescent paint applied to stone walls. For a moment, I must emphasize the vision itself without any consideration paid to the utilitarian purposes of this place, the functions served in retaliation to the factory above it. The truth is that at some point all the factory's functions were driven to this underground graveyard level. Long before the complete evaporation of the machinery of the tower, something happened to require the shutdown of all operations in the three floors of the factory which were above the ground level. The reasons for this action are deeply obscure, a matter uh, for contemplation only when a state of hopeless and devouring curiosity has reached its height, when the burning light of speculation becomes so intense that it threatens to incinerate everything on which it shines. To my own mind, it seems entirely valid to reiterate at this juncture the long withstanding tensions that existed between the Red Tower, which I believe was not always stigmatized by such a hue and title, and the grayish landscape of utter desolation that surrounded this structure on all sides, looming above it for quite incalculable distances. But, Below the ground level of the factory was another matter. It was here that its operations at some point retreated. It was here specifically at this graveyard level that they continued. Clearly, the Red Tower had committed some violation or offense. Its clamoring activities and unorthodox products perhaps its very existence constituting an affront to the changeless quietude of the world around it. In my personal judgment, there had been a betrayal involved, a treacherous breaking of the bond. I can certainly picture a time before the existence of the factory, before any of its features blemished the featureless country that extended so gray and so desolate on every side. Dreaming 
upon the grayish desolation of that landscape, I can also find it quite easy to imagine that there might have occurred some lapse in monumental tedium, a spontaneous and inexplicable pulse to deviate from a dreary perfection. Perhaps even an unconquerable desire to risk a move toward a tempting defectiveness, a concession to this impulse or desire out of nowhere as a minimal surrender, a creation took place and a structure took form where there had been nothing of its kind before. I picture it at its inception as a barely discernible, discernible eruption in the landscape a mere sketch of an edifice, possibly translucent when making its first appearance. A gray density rising into the grayness, embossed upon it in a most tasteful and harmonious design. But such structures or creations have their own desires, their own destinies to fulfill, their own mysteries and mechanisms that they must follow at whatever the risk. From a gray and desolate and utterly featureless landscape, a dull edifice had produced a pale, possibly translucent tower, which over time began to develop into a factory and to issue, as if in the spirit of the most grotesque belligerence, a line of quite morbid, quite wonderfully disgusting novelty goods in an expression of defiance. At some point, it reddened with an enigmatic passion for betrayal and perversity. On the surface, the red tower might have seemed a splendid complement to the grayish desolation of its surroundings, making a unique picturesque composition that served to define the glorious essence of each of them. But in fact, there existed between them a profound and ineffable hostility. An attempt was made to reclaim the red tower or at least to draw it back toward the formless origins of its being. I'm referring, of course, to that show of force which resulted in the evaporation of the factory's dense arsenal of machinery. Each of the three stories of the Red Tower had been cleaned out, purged of its offending means of manufacturing novelty items, and the part of the factory that rose above the ground was left to fall into ruins. Had the machinery in the Red Tower not evaporated, I believe in that subterranean graveyard, or something very much like it, would nonetheless have come into existence at some point or another. This was the direction in which the factory had been moving, a fact suggested by some of its later models of novelty items. Machines were becoming obsolete as the diseased mania of the Red Tower intensified and evolved into more experimental and even visionary projects. I have previously reported that the headstones in the factory's subterranean graveyard were absent of any names of the interred and were without dates of birth and death. This has been confirmed by numerous accounts rendered in the borderline gibberish. The reason for these blank headstones is entirely evident as one gazes upon them standing crooked and closely packed together in the phosphorescent haze given off by the stone walls covered with luminous paint. None of these graves, in point of fact, could be said to have anyone buried in them whose names and dates of birth and death would require inscription on the headstones. These were not what one might call burying graves. This is to say that these were in no sense graves for burying the dead. Quite the contrary, these were graves of a highly experimental design from which the newest productions of the Red Tower were to be born. From its beginnings as a manufacturer of novelty items of an extravagant nature, 
The factory had now gone into the business of creating what became known as hyperorganisms. These new productions were also of a fundamentally extreme nature, representing an even greater divergence on the part of the Red Tower from the bland and gray desolation in the mist in which it stood. As implied by their designation as hyperorganisms, this line of goods displayed the most essential qualities of their organic nature, which meant, of course, that they were wildly conflicted in their two basic features. On the one hand, they manifested an intense vitality in all aspects of their form and function. On the other hand, and simultaneously, they manifested an electable element of decay in these same areas. To state this matter in the most lucid terms, each of these hyperorganisms, even as they scintillated with an obscene degree of vital impulses, also, and at the same time, had degeneracy and death written deeply upon them. In accord with the tradition of dumbstruck insanity, it seems the less said about these offspring of the birthing graves or any other similar creations, the better. I myself have been almost entirely restricted to a state of seething speculation concerning the luscious particularities of all hyper-organic phenomena produced in the subterranean graveyard of the Red Tower. Although we may reasonably assume that such creations were not to be called beautiful, we cannot know for ourselves the mysteries and mechanisms of, for instance, how these creations moved throughout the hazy luminescence of that underground world, what creaky or spasmic gestures they might have been capable of executing, if any what sounds they might have made or the organs they used for making them, how they might have appeared awkwardly emerging deep from in the shadows or squatting against the nameless headstones, what trembling stages of mutation they almost certainly would have undergone following the generation of their larvae upon the barren earth of the graveyard, what their bodies might have produced or emitted in the ways of fluid and secretions how they might have responded to the mutilation of their forms for reasons of an experimental or entirely savage nature. Often, I picture to myself what frantically clawing efforts they themselves made through that confining environment which their malformed or non-existent brains could not even understand. They could not have comprehended any more than I could for what purpose they were born from those graves, those incubators of hyperorganisms, minute factories of flesh that existed wholly within and far below the great factory of the Red Tower. It was no surprise, of course, that the production of hyperorganisms was not allowed to continue for very long before a second wave of destruction was visited upon the factory. This time was not merely the fading and ultimate evaporation of the machinery that took place, this time, it was something far more brutal. Once again, the forces of ruination were directed at the factory, specifically the subterranean graveyard at its second underground level. Its three-story structure stood above ground, having already been rendered an echoing ruin. Information on what remained of the graveyard and of its cleverly blasphemous works is available to my own awareness only in the form of shuddering and badly garbled whispers of mayhem and destruction and wholesale sundering of the most unspeakable sort. These same sources also seem to regard this incident as the culmination if not the conclusion of the long-standing hostilities between the Red Tower and that grayish halo of desolation that hovered around it on all sides. Such a shattering episode would appear to have terminated the career of the Red Tower. Nevertheless, there are indications that appearances to the contrary, the factory, 
continues to be active despite its status as a silent ruin. After all, the evaporation of the machinery which turned out countless novelty items in the three-story red brick factory proper and the ensuing obsolescence of its sophisticated systems of tunnels at the first underground level did not prevent the factory from pursuing its business by other more devious means. The work at the second underground level, the graveyard level, went very well for a time. Following the vicious decimation of those ingenious and fertile graves, along with the merchandise they produced, it may have seemed that the manufacturing history of the Red Tower had been brought to a close. Yet, there are indications that below the three-story above-ground factory, below the first and second underground levels, there exists a third level of subterranean activity. Perhaps it is only for a desire for symmetry, a hunger for compositional balance in things that has led to a series of most vaporous rumors and into this third underground level in order to provide a kind of complementary proportion to the three stories of the Red Tower that rise into the gray and featureless landscape above ground. At this third level, these rumors maintain the factory schedule of production is being carried out in some new and strange manner, representing its most ambitious venture in the output of putrid creations, ultimately consummating in its tradition of degeneracy, reaching toward a perfection of defect and disorder, according to every polluted and foggy rumor concerned with this issue. Perhaps it seems that I have said too much about the Red Tower, and perhaps it has sounded far too strange. Do not think that I am not aware of such things. But, as I have noted throughout this document, I am only repeating what I've heard. I myself have never seen the Red Tower. No one ever has, and possibly no one ever will. And yet, wherever I go, people are talking about it. In one way or another, they are talking about the nightmarish novelty items, or about the mysterious and revolting hyperorganisms, as well as babbling endlessly about the subterranean system of tunnels and the secluded graveyard whose headstones display no names and no dates designating either birth or death. Everything that they are saying is about the Red Tower in one way or another, and nothing else is about the Red Tower. We're all talking about the Red Tower in our own degenerate way. I have only recorded what everyone else is saying, though they may not know that they're saying it. And sometimes what they have seen, though they may not know that they have seen it. But still, they are always talking in one or deranged way or another about the Red Tower. I hear them talk of it every day of my life unless of course they begin to speak about that gray and desolate landscape that hazy void into which the red tower that great and industrious red tower is so precariously nestled then the voices grow quiet until i can barely hear them as they attempt to communicate with me in the choking scraps of post-nightmare trauma 
Now is just such a time when I must strain to hear the voices. I wait for them to reveal to me the new ventures of the Red Tower as it proceeds into even more corrupt phases of production, including the creations being turned out by the shadowy workshop in its third subterranean level. I must keep still and listen for the voices. I must remain quiet for a terrifying moment. Then I will begin to hear the news of the factory starting up its operations once more. Then I will be able to speak again of the Red Tower. The factory, ruined, stood three stories high in an otherwise featureless landscape. Although somewhat imposing on its own terms, it occupied only the most unobtrusive place within the gray emptiness of its surroundings, its presence serving as a mere accident upon a desolate horizon. No road led to the factory, nor were there any traces. My height led to it at some point in the distant past. If there ever had been such a road, it would have been rendered useless to the 